What did you like about Andrew Tate? What I did like out about Andrew Tate, I still like about Andrew Tate. I like his... You interviewing Chris Eubank Senior. That was the most bizarre, awkward... I asked the questions. You're no teacher here, no your place. Who's the one guest who you've loved? I interviewed Stephen, Jake Paul, Andrew Tate, Katie Hopkins, Chris Eubank. I'm not under the illusion that I should be happy all the time. I just want to know how your mind works in wanting more and more and more because does that actually bring you happiness? Someone messages you, you can get Joe Rogan on next week for X amount of money. He's in the UK, he's only coming once. Do you do it or not? No. Bull I would not pay 20 bags for Joe Rogan or Conor McGregor. Well, then you're, a f you, no. you're not taking podcasting seriously Why? enough. I didn't think you were a bottler. That's a... Uh... Rob, welcome to the show, mate. Dodge. It's about time, isn't it? It is. It has been on the cards for a while. Yeah. Uh, Harry said, where did you meet Dodge? We met on Clubhouse, didn't we? We did. We met on yeah. Clubhouse. My God. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I picked up a few good friends from Clubhouse, yeah. actually. It's Clubhouse a shame they was, fucked it. It's a shame they fucked it. Yeah. You are did. right. You know what? But it was good timing for everyone's minds. Yeah. And to meet new people and have good chats. Yeah. It was everything you lost in lockdown, you got in Clubhouse. Yeah. The connection, meeting new people, having interesting yeah. conversations. Yeah. They just turned their back on entrepreneurs too quick. And I think we're a bit left about the revenue. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's You a were shame. all in, weren't you? Yeah, you well, were, I, I you were hosting rooms like every hour across America and across here and da 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 da. Yeah. Did I became you, the you, did you, did you? 80th, 80th highest followed person on Clubhouse within about nine months. Yeah. I'd sort of semi retired from my businesses. Yeah. I've done it a few times over the years mm. and I had time. Yeah. And just, we all had yeah. plenty of time, didn't we? Yeah. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you become an entrepreneur? Um, well, Growing up wasn't really something I did anywhere for any length of time because dad kept moving us around the place. So my dad's always owned pubs, bars, hotels, the odd little club. And so we always moved around Cambridgeshire mm. and around that area. So I don't really have a home in terms of where I'm from. I've lived in Peterborough for the longest amount of time, which is since I was probably 17. So what was pub life like for you? Because I grew up in pubs from a very young age, from the age of like three. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah all was, the way up to yeah. 18 plus. Yeah, so what was good about living in pubs is the constant supply of cold Coca-Cola in the in the old school bottles. In bottles, then yeah. it turned to the squirters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then the downside of that was it made me fat. Um, I, I was like a pool shark from a very young age Same. because that's what else did you have to do yeah, except mate. play pool yeah um but emotionally probably fucked me up a bit because um mum and dad would have to go and work downstairs in the pub and i'd me and my sister would often just be left mm. not criticizing my parents they mm. did you know i couldn't wish for any better parents but we were left alone a lot from a young age, even though they were still in the same building. So, yeah, that created quite a sense of loneliness. I've paid a lot of therapists a lot of money to sort of dig into why at times I can feel very lonely. Um, yeah, so I don't really have a where I'm from. Mm. I mean, I support Liverpool in football. Mm. Um but what was school life like for you? You just what I just rolled back a bit there. You said, you know, drinking coke, eating loads of crisps, eating yeah. pub food. Just I, I was the, the same. The big Walkers crisp Mate, box. I used to get them from the. Yeah. I used to get the KP man come in the morning. And it yeah. was two pound a box. I had like six boxes in my bedroom. Yeah, I get it. I get where yeah. you're coming from. It's like there was no nothing back there to say you can't eat that. You can't do this. You can't. It's just you were just grabbing eating eating pub foods, lasagna, chili con yeah. carne, whatever it may be. Yeah. How did that affect your mind? How did it affect you when you were at school, knowing that you were getting bloating up, getting bigger? Yeah, that was um, most of my pain comes from that source of being the fattest kid in my year. For probably two to three years straight, I was the token. So if you're like the second, so if you're the second fattest kid in the year, you can always go, well, he's fatter yeah. <laughs> and the, the butt of the jokes were never on the third yeah. fattest kid yeah. they were on the fattest kid and um 
that was me and I, f I, I hated it more than anything I can tell you. And I always felt so lonely because anytime any of the other kids were talking and whispering, I just always assumed it was about me. And sometimes it was, but often it wasn't. And so I created this real like outsider complex. And um, weirdly looking back, it gave me some skills with people because I learned to get on with everyone because it was my only way back in. So even though I couldn't get the girls back then, I could all, I, they were, I was friends with everyone. I learned to how to be friends with everyone. But then the downside of that was it made me a bit of a, a people pleaser type person. I couldn't have any conflict because conflict meant you're ostracized, you're last picked at rugby, yeah. you, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I, it, it was horrible. And I lost, the, I, I begged my mum and dad to, to get me to leave the school because it was also a boarding school. So it, it's worse evenings, it's worse bullying. weekends. A lot of bullying. Yeah. It? I want to make it really clear. There was no individual kid at school who was a horrendous bully to me, like some people have experienced. Actually, it was just kids being kids. But, you know, kids can be fucking cruel yeah. and they don't know it. And they probably, like, I remember seeing school friends 20 years later and we talk about this and they didn't even know yeah. because they were just growing up being kids. But I probably build it up as much in my mind as it was in reality. And so I would cry to my mum and dad. I would cry to my mum every weekend and never to my dad. Yeah. And I'd beg, I begged them to let me change schools. And I had this goal. If mum and dad let me leave this school to go to whatever school, I don't care, um, I'll lose all the weight in the summer holidays. So I lost three stone in eight or nine weeks, which is not healthy no. when you're 14 years no. old. Were you and, the, just give me an idea of what size you were. How much were you weighing in at? Um, I guess about 13 stone. As a, what, a 12 year old? Yeah. Year old. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And was sport in your life? Yeah. It was? Yeah. Like, I got good at sport because I was fat. Yeah. So getting good at sport meant I got some appreciation and love. Yeah. So I was opening bat for the county at cricket. I was prop at rugby, yeah. one of the upsides. <laughs> when you're that young, the yeah. fat kid is prop. Get, get him in there. You'll do good. Yeah, I mean, it's different now. Yeah, but, course. you know, the fat kids were the props. Yeah. The skinny kid was the hooker. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's how it yeah. was back yeah, yeah. then. What were you thinking from the age you went to, obviously, university up to probably 21? That 21 to 26, how were you earning a pound note? A, a chain of very quick events happened. I went to a property networking event locally. Now, I used to hate what I would deem to be yuppies. You know, or the I was, RP, do you remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. anyone in a suit and yeah. a tie and a briefcase, yeah. uh, you know, someone in the city, I would hate them. Mm. I liked Radiohead and Rage Against the Machine, and I didn't even know it, but I was quite sort of lefty, yeah. ironic, because I wanted to be successful. And, and it came out of nowhere, really. And then, so I thought going to a property networking event, they're just all going to be greedy, selfish, suited up yuppies, where I'm some spiky haired artist with holes in his jeans before that was a thing. Um, <laughs> And I had all this baggage, but it was all noise. It wasn't yeah. any based on anything real. But when what happened with my dad, I just went. Because I knew, I, I, and actually it wasn't as bad as I thought. And there was more normal people there than I thought. Mm. And on that very first meeting, I met my business partner, still of today, Mark Comer. Um, and then within a few weeks, he got me a job in his property company. And within um, a few weeks... I was earning enough money to start knocking my debt down. Within a year, I got all my debt down. I'd earned nearly 100 grand. My business partner and I had about 20 properties together. So it all started to fit together really quick. What was his name? Mark Homer? Yeah. Yeah, he's okay. still, still my business partner today. To today, is it? Yeah. Right? Okay. What did he see in you, do you reckon? Did he know you were 50 grand in debt? No. No. And I didn't know he had loads of money. <laughs> I bet you did. I did when it, I, got him, I got him pissed one time and he told me how much yeah. money he had. And I was like, right, My, six months later, we had 20 properties <laughs> quality. with his money. Quality. Was your brainchild the events in property? Yeah. Or was it Mark's? Well, I, I don't think it's fair to say it was my brainchild because I wasn't the first person to ever run training and education. No, but where did you see the opportunity going? I've been to a couple of these. We can do this better. Yeah. So I went to a few events where people were teaching property and I thought they've not really got any charisma. Mm. Um, they're all 25 years older than Mark and I. So I thought big opportunity. But I also had to feel credible. And I think I, I can't say exactly, but maybe when we got to 50 properties that we'd bought, because we used to sell some, package some, give yeah. them, you know, yeah. charge other people to buy them. But there was a time, it was around about 08, 09, where I thought, you know what, I know enough. And what I don't know, Mark does. And all right, even though we're 
a fairly upstart-ish. Everyone seems to be going bust. I, I'm going to write a book. We should throw a course together. Yeah. And, um, and that's what we did. Did you always want to build an empire? Yeah. You did, did yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You never wanted to go for a lifestyle, what the, 12, 12 staff and have a real nice lifestyle around it. But why would you stop? Mm. So Harry and I were talking in the car today. I have seven cars. Most of them are supercars. And Harry's like, well, you yeah. But, seven cars? Yeah. What, what, what cars have what, you got? What have you got? Porsche Panamera Turbo S, Aerial Atom, Porsche 911, new, newer one, um, Range Rover, 1989 Porsche Turbo, the bad boys one. How old are you, Dodge? 46. Right, so we're similar age, I'm 44. Mm. So you remember the film Bad Boys, Will Smith? Yeah. And that, that yeah, Porsche, yeah. which most young men yeah. drooled over or other things. Mm -hmm. um, did I just say the Testarossa? No. No, the F Ferrari, Testarossa. Um, I don't know, is that... Oh, and, and a Lamborghini Aventador. I don't know why I always forget that one. Um, I'm just about to buy a um, Aston Martin DBS, and like, I take it you're just a car love cars. Yeah, you have to with yeah. that amount of cars. Yeah, and I, I, have, and, and I, I have, stop. I have no interest in cars. I have no interest in watches. Okay, I love both of those. Like more than. Yep. You know, people say our oh, money doesn't make you happy. It fucking does. Mm. I've been broken. I've been rich. And I tell you, I'm a lot happier mm. when I'm No, rich. I get it. I totally yeah. get it. It's nothing to do with money. It's just not, in it. that just doesn't interest me. Well, I've got a nice. It's cheap. It's cheaper to not nice be interested in those car. things. car. Yeah. Half of the stuff I don't know how to use. Well, that's perfect. But it, let's say you loved cars. Mm. Why, why would you get to a number and stop? You wouldn't. You'd what, with all, cars? Yeah. Well, I only need one car. Yeah, but no, if you liked cars. Oh, God, if I liked cars and I was addicted to cars and the. And I'd think, oh, yeah, that's my bag. I would go for it. Yeah. And, 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 probably, he, the, and probably the same with watches, but I'm not a, uh, a showy person. Uh, it, yeah. Because uh, I would feel a uh, plum driving around in a Lamborghini. Yeah. I would. Yeah. If I stopped at the lights and I had a red Ferrari and I'd look up and see a load of fellas in the back, I'd think, oh, no. That's, but that's just me. Yeah. Well, remember, I was the fat kid at school who never got noticed by anyone. So I'm... I, I was. I used to be showy. Mm. I'm a bit less like that now. I like don't. I often of all these cars I've got, I hardly drive a lot of them, um, and I often just drive the Porsche, which is the most understated one, even though it's 700 horsepower. But the point I was going to make you said, why don't you want a lifestyle business? Because like I'm not going to stop at seven cars. I'm going to buy my favourite Ferrari F40 Classic, and I'm going to buy. A, I'm <laughs> then going to get a bigger house so I can have an underground garage so I can have even more cars. Why would you ever stop? <laughs> Mm. People think there's a destination. There's no destination. But, what, what are you going to do? You think, uh, I'm not going to get any more guests now on the podcast. I can see that. Mm. Eventful Entrepreneur Podcast. Eventful Host Lives. We've actually changed yes. to Eventful Lives. Yes, and I know why you've done mm. that. We'll Host go on to that. Hosted by Dodge Woodall, and you've got all the list of guests you've yeah. had. What are you going to do? Oh, no, I've, I've got Because you've got enough guests there. Yeah. You, know? you, yeah. could, you could just focus on getting those episodes out to more people. Mm. No, no, no. You're going to keep in interviewing guests. Mm. You're not going to stop. Why are you going to stop? Because I, I absolutely love doing a podcast. Yeah, I actually, I absolutely love building businesses. I love building businesses. And I've built some amazing businesses and sold businesses. And I've got some brilliant businesses at the moment. But I just don't have the urge to buy cars and watches. The thing for me is nice long lunches, good food, nice holidays and good friends around me. Yeah. That's, that just makes me content. Yeah. And I've got a lovely car. But that's just me. And yeah. I'm content with that. I just want to know how your mind works in wanting more and more and more because does that actually bring you happiness right there's a very long way to answer this let's question. go short way all right i cleared the day for you <laughs> <laughs> oh fucking day <laughs> bitch you don't Fuck like me, you. I've, I've got you for a whole day yeah you can oh edit out God. the bitch yeah. you don't like <laughs> well I, I, one thing i just want to say quickly is I'm a fan of long form content. I'm, I, I, I do the short form because you have to, mm. but I'm a fan of long form, mm. not short form. I like good conversations. There you go. If it's a shit conversation, it'd be short form. There you go. Or, or just a good conversation. edit, 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 yeah. edit. So, okay. So I believe that one of the main purposes of life is progress. So we become stronger. So we evolve as a species. And happiness is not evolution. Happiness is a reward emotion that we get. Are you happy? 
Let me, let me... Um, no, 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 no. Are you happy? No one is happy. I People dis- are... I, I disagree. No. Well, everyone's entitled to my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Do, are there times in your life when you get angry? Very rarely. But there are. There are. Yeah, there are. Yeah. Are there times where you get frustrated? Very rarely, but, but there but are. There, but I guess there there are. But there are. Are there times where you feel lonely? No. Never. 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 Because I've been an entrepreneur since the day I was born. I've never had a job. So people who become entrepreneurs then realise that there's lots of loneliness. Okay. I'm just used to it. Ha- have you ever been screwed over by anyone? What that I haven't got hold of. Yeah, and whatever. got my money back. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, have you ever been screwed over by anyone? I've always got my you, money back. Yeah, but but did they yeah, screw you over yeah. for you to get your money back? Uh, uh, they, they, uh, yes, I yeah, guess so. Okay. But they didn't. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever in your life felt envy or jealousy ever? Even if it was fleeting and you were a boy, have you ever felt envy or jealousy? I must have, but yeah. I don't feel like yeah. I'm an envious or a jealous so, person. I, so the point I'm trying to make yeah. is, there are times when you are happy, mm. and there are times when you are frustrated, angry, envious, jealousy. Mm. Why? Because all of those emotions are required for you as this vessel of a human. If they weren't required, you wouldn't feel them. As, and they serve a purpose. But as we get older, you push those ones away. You don't want them to come into your life. You don't want the envy. You don't want the jealousy. You don't want to be, like we're saying, fucked off or angry. I just don't want them in my life. No, so you work hard to remove them and you work on being happy. 100%. There you go. So I, you yeah. are not happy. You are working very hard to feel more positive than negative emotions. 100%. There you go. Because you have to work it. Yeah. But then you have to know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Yes. But, and that's often but, trial and error, isn't but it? But countryside makes me happy. Nice food makes me happy. Yeah. A lovely wife and lovely friends. All these things make me happy. Not material things for me. No. But material things to you may make you happy, but I always have to question that with people. Go, but do they make you happy? Because having sent seven cars, I've got friends who've got five, six cars and they're car addicts. Are they happy? No. But why? Do you get the buzz? Do you get the buzz when you buy? I don't know how much these cars are. They sound expensive. But do you get a buzz when you've dropped 300 grand on a car and gone, oh, I've drive that back home, but fuck, that was uncomfy. But it's an expensive car. No. No, you're talking like someone that doesn't have an interest in cars. <laughs> That's because, very true. Like, <laughs> no, yeah, like you yeah. don't buy a Lamborghini Aventador for it to be comfortable. Yeah. You buy it because it sounds fucking unreal and it looks fucking unreal. And also, I'll tell you one of the reasons why I buy supercars. Because I can, because I always wanted them when I was young, but I felt useless. Yeah. And now I'm not used to it. So that's, so I, I get that bit. So I, I understand why you're buying them then, because yeah. maybe this is deep rooted to you. It is. Some sort of trauma. Of course it gone is. On I like collecting nice things as well. Mm. I, have all, I collect nice clothes. I collect nice watches. I've always liked collecting yeah. things. Why? Because collection is progress. Mm. So, so like, I, I, I totally get you there. Progress is something that I'm addicted to. Yeah, because that is inbuilt in you. Yeah. Because if you don't progress, you don't evolve and improve as a human. Agreed. Humanity doesn't. I have to evolve. progress every day. Yeah. Whether it's the podcast, whether it's getting more people to the festival, yes. whether it's tweaking yes. my businesses, yes. whether it's improving my staff's yes. lifestyle, I want to get yeah. every day. That's where and I get that, my buzz from. And that's in you. Yeah. And by the way, that doesn't always make... That and happiness can conflict. Because sometimes you make progress and you feel happy because you progressed. Yeah. But sometimes you're frustrated because you're not progressing enough. I get that as well. That bit so there, you're not always there. happy then? No, no, no. But I get that. The frustration yeah. of not progressing. And so that's that fr- why I like yeah. to progress every single freaking yes. day. Because that's my buzz. So the frustration that's is good. That's my addiction. Yes. So the frustration is good. Why? Because it's forcing the progress. Yes. Because if you're just like, oh, no, Rob, I'm really happy and content. Yeah. There would be no frustration. Therefore, there would be no drive for yeah. progress. So, it's that fr- so, so yeah. this is the, yeah. I, I think this is a really important point. So let us just stay yeah. on it for a yeah. minute. So you initially asked, am I happy? Overall, I'm fucking grateful for my life. I said this to Harry on the way down. Uh, uh, anything I could have ever wished for when I was 12 years old, Absolutely. I, I have it, yeah. got and more. And I am really grateful. An amazing family. I love all my staff. I love what I've built, blah, blah, blah. But no, I'm not happy all the time. Sometimes I'm thoroughly fucked off, thoroughly frustrated. I'm like, I should be doing better than I am. 
why did I mess that up? And, and I'm not under the illusion mm. that I should be happy all the time. And I'm not chasing the delusional fantasy that, well, if I just do this, this and this, then I'll have eternal happiness. Yeah. Because eternal happiness is the tease as the reward for the struggle. Mm. Like, you're a fit guy, mm. you've got good muscles, you didn't just get them, you go down the gym and work out every day. And no matter how good you look, you always want to be fitter, stronger and better. Mm. Mm. So I think the purpose of life is growth and progress. And to go through that, you have to have hardship. The muscles don't grow unless mm. they're ripped. Mm. You don't get fitter unless you gas. So this is why... Hardship is a lovely thing. Because there's only one way out. Well, there's two ways out. There's two ways out, back I guess. Or back or forward, forward yeah. yeah. But of going at that forward route. Yeah. But you just said there about the gym. That's all great hitting the gym, what have you. But if you're not putting good food into your body, you're not gonna your body's not gonna react well. Your mind is not gonna react well. And I'm really, really intrigued in nutrition. I love nutrition. And I find that if you eat well and you train, brilliant. But you can't just train and eat shit and expect to be good. Mm. Yeah, I'm no food expert. My wife definitely is. And Are you she, addicted to food? She would agree with that. Um, I have major emotional baggage around food. Mm. Um, and the only thing that keeps me probably from not being fat again is the fear of being fat. Yeah. So yeah, I have a bit of a fucked up relationship with food. But... Um, I'm training for a fight. My fight is in six weeks. It's like a charity boxing match, except we've got a hundred grand bet and it's in front of 1,600 people. And for the first time since I was 12, you've I got feel to, like... You've got to take I, the top off uh, well, I'm, in front I'm, of a crowd. Yeah, I'm eating guilt-free. Yeah. I'm, I'm training a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm training a hell of a Give lot. Give me an example. Um, is there a white-collar boxing match? Well, it depends how you define it. Um, you've got head guards on? No. Nope. Good. 12-ounce gloves? 12-ounce gloves. Who so, are you fighting? A guy called Samuel Leeds is another guy in the property space, a lot bigger than me. And why are you fighting him? Um, one, to raise £130,000 for charity, which is the goal which I think I'll achieve. Brilliant. Two, take, he, take, he, that, take that charity thing out of the equation. Why are you fighting Samuel he Leeds? He called me out on a podcast. He, he said, um, I understand you think you could beat me in a fight. Will you put your money where your mouth is? And I, I'm a bit of a sucker for a challenge. <laughs> so he said that on a podcast, yeah, did he? Yeah. So are you competitors in, the, in your world? Yeah. Well, I mean... I think he's after a bit of leveraging our brand. We have a bigger property brand. We've been in the business longer than him. What's his brand called? Um, it, his name's Samuel Leeds. It's all based around his own name. Okay. So yeah. he's doing the same thing, buying plenty of property. Is he doing the events everywhere? Yeah. Yeah, okay. he's the buying pro I, I don't know how much he's So you two are looking at each other again. Hold on, mate. Let's have a little clash here. I don't like your business. You don't like my business. Let's have a fight. Well, I And at the same time, we'll raise some money. Yeah, I mean, he's really good at the, um, if you're being kind, you'd call him a marketer. Yeah. If you're not, you'd call him a trash talker or a bullshitter. Right, okay. He's great at the hype. Okay. Um, and so... Are you good at the hype? Yeah, but there's more truth in my hype. Okay. Yeah, because there's, there's hype and then there's pushing the boundaries and then there's bullshit. Right, okay. I can't comment on where he is on that, but I'm certainly lower on the on the Richter scale yeah of, on, on the of Richter the scale <laughs> yeah the, the bs ometer. um do you fancy your chances against him I've won the fight already you have you yeah okay. yeah yeah I'm training fucking hard um eating well yeah well this is your last question mm. about so I'm eating guilt free for the first time in my life and everyone around me my wife my trainers they're all like Rob you're not eating enough you need to eat more and they're trying to just and basically like just eat what you want get the calories in and I've never been able to do that I've always felt really guilty yeah. about that so for the first time ever I'm eating a volume of food where I might put on a bit of muscle mm. or at least retain weight and even despite that I've lost nearly eight kilos and not I wasn't exact I wasn't fat to start so what are you weighing in at the moment stone wise 80 80 kilos 80 kilos okay which for someone who's 6 13, foot 3 13 13 and a half stone it's light but something like that. Okay. it's light I, I, I imagine I'll be fighting in the high 70s how seriously are you taking this on a scale I'm of I'm training like 10. a world champion okay training like a world champion ask him I'm a psycho trainer and what about like your mind no one trains harder than and me and what about your mindset I've already won the fight okay I already worked out how to win the fight I've already won the fight. And um, he, the way he wins the fight is a um, 
uh, what you call in boxing a puncher's chance. A big windmill. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Because he, he can't outspeed me. He already knows it. Yeah. He can't um, out technique me. He already knows it. He can't out fitness me. So if you can't do all those, what can you do? You've got you've got to go for the knockout. He might have a good right hander though. I'm not saying he's not. You've got to be careful. Not yeah. saying he's not. Yeah. That's what a puncher's chance yeah. is. Yeah. Um, so I, I've already gone to that place in my mind where what if he cleans me out with one of those? Okay. And I've already been there. I went there 20 weeks ago. What, I, what are you? If he knocks you out clean, what's gone through your mind? Um, I've raised 130 grand for charity. It just so happens that I had to give it to 100 grand to his charity. Yep. I have got fitter than I've ever been. Um, my lifestyle in every way is really good. I stood in the ring. Mm. Most people... That's ballsy to do uh, straight away. Do you know yeah. what? Just getting in the ring and having a... Because when people say white collar, it's almost... I know you didn't, but a lot of people are like, mm. white collar. Mm. Mm. White oh, collar. no, you can't turn your nose no, down. Anyone gets in the ring. Getting in the ring is is hardcore. And, and also... When's the last time you had a street fight? I've never had a street okay. fight. Okay, when's the last time you had a fight? Like a proper fight. I've yeah. never had a proper fight. Okay, so this is I'm your not, first yeah. fight. You never had a fight on a rugby pitch or any... Or no, no. no. I'm, I'm the people pleaser, remember? Okay, well, of course, I'm yeah. the one splitting the fight up. <laughs> I'm a lover, not so a you're, fighter. So you're going straight in. And how big Samuel Lee? Well, he started at 118 kilos. He started... What's he weighing in at the I moment? I don't know. Roughly. You've seen I don't know. Uh, it's difficult to say. He's, he just, he's, he's just good at playing games. He posted a photo, photo recently of him looking in quite good shape, but it was an old photo of mm. way back when, and everyone was like, ooh. Mm. So like, I, don't, I don't know and I don't care. Mm. Maybe I'm going to guess 105. And you're coming in 80. And what, what height is he? You're six foot two, six foot I'm three? I'm six three. He's What's he? Um, six foot. Six foot, okay. I, I and he might, come, he might come in at two, three stone heavier than you. Mm. Yeah. How quick are your hands? Quicker than his. <laughs> I like it. So, uh, so tell, me my the, head, tell me the so date. My of the, footwork. Tell me the date of this fight. July the first. And whereabouts? Um, it is Brentwood. Is it Essex? Brentwood, Essex. We've we've pretty much now sold out the main sports venue there. Brilliant. There's a, a handful of tickets left, I think. Which is not bad. You've got matchroom sports. Out. Eddie Hearn involved? No, no, <laughs> no. We're just doing it ourselves. Okay. Um, we were up there last week, in fact, weren't we? Up in Brentwood with. With the boys up there. So I, I've put myself in some uncomfortable positions in training to try and mimic how yeah. I might feel. Yeah. If you don't mind, I won't talk about those because I don't want him to get any advantage knowing what I'm up to. But believe you me, I've gone to places and put myself in uncomfortable situations to, to prepare myself. I've spoken in front of thousands of people on a regular basis yeah. as a public speaker anyway. So, yeah, I, I could. The thing is, if, if I get an adrenaline dump and it halves my speed and my fitness, well, if mine's 10 times better than him, I'm still... At an advantage yep. and if it does it to me it'll do it to him mm. while we're on boxing tell me about you interviewing chris eubank senior yeah so um that was the most bizarre <laughs> awkward um i remember at university whenever my mates used to throw up Everyone would make an announcement and go and watch the person throw up, stand in a circle and watch him. And everyone's like, oh, don't look. And then you have to look. Yeah. And me interviewing Chris Eubank was like that. It was so awkward and so tense, but it made it compelling viewing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Where it, was it? Who set it up? Shah? Uh, Shah set it up. Where was she, it? No, no, she didn't set it up. Um, we did it. Yeah, we did it ourselves. But Shah, she, you know, she knows him. Yeah. She's friends with him. And on the day... It ended up happening five hours after it was booked in. Um, he, Chris was just all over the place. And we were going through his agent and then him. And then in the end, I was with Shah that day. And Shah was just like, look, let me just call him. And, and she hustled. And in the end, we found somewhere. Where is it? We did it. Soho House, was it? A random ass. Yeah, it, a, yeah, a random ass place, as Harry. I remember said. seeing it. And I was yeah. like, oh, my God. I remember seeing the interview going, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was like. Because he put you under pressure at times. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I get, but he put yeah. you under pressure, and then you were like, "This is odd." Everything was odd about it. Yeah. Was he in a good mental state? Do you think? It's difficult to know. I'm not a mental health expert. It, it wasn't really my place to say because um, number one, I think he's he, he openly smokes weed, yeah. and um, I could definitely smell it. Can't say I saw him have a joint, mm. but I can say I smelt it. Mm. So there's that. How, how he's been punched in the head mm. a million times mm. so just those two things could make someone slow eccentric and he just lost his boy there you go and that mm. so um 
I'm not close to him to know what his mental health is really like. But you, you must know. have sensed though. Like we're all watching that. We we all sensed, and there was a lot of controversy around that. You must have sensed something when you're in there. Well, that's a bit like you saying to me when I finish my fight, Rob. Just um, recount the last three two minute rounds exactly what happened. I won't remember. It's just yeah. bang. Mm. It's what everyone says about having mm. done it. I was in there. We're doing it. I'm like. Like it was, it was shock or surprise. What the fuck? Am I really here? Pinch myself. Over gone. Yeah. So no, you don't get that because there was no setup, was there? It was on a couch, on a couch. Let's go filming with the cameras are on. Let's go. Yeah. And it was, but no, there was no real. I wasn't in the middle of it thinking, fuck. I don't think he's very well, and there's going to be a major backlash from this. Never once yeah. did did I have that because you're just in it. Yeah. You don't really know, and you don't know how it's going to be received. Yeah. And of course, in you know, you're an interviewer. So you want to be in the conversation, but you've also got to be in your head about the next question. Yeah. And, and so you're not, mm. you, sometimes you're thinking about the next question as opposed to listening to the answer. So it's all just like a great big freaking whirlwind. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> but it, it's, um, it's, it's his manager and his family's responsibility. So I don't usually pay for guests, mm. but I paid for Chris Eubank. Well, how much did you pay him? I'll keep that confidential. I think it's the right thing to do. But it went through his manager. So it's his manager's responsibility. Roughly, how much did you pay him? Because he's got, he's got, everyone's got a number on them. Everyone's got <laughs> a figure on them. <laughs> nah, I'm not going to say. I don't think it's right. Yeah. I didn't think you were a bottler. That's a... That is a judgmental thing to say. <laughs> just because I, Just because I respect someone's confidentiality doesn't Who's make me a bother. Your, your convent, convent, confidentiality. It could be mine. It could be Chris Eubanks. I mean, you're just... You, you, we're going down the road of Chris's mental health and now you're um, talking I about know the how much fee. You, I want to know how much you paid him. I'll tell you off air as a friend. Okay. North. I'll tell you off air as a friend. North of 10 grand? Are you, are you happy with me? I, I normally... Just blur everything out. This is, and th this is the second thing on a podcast I've declined to say. I actually feel really good about that. Because the two reasons I'm not telling you are for protection of others. So I'm, um, I'm pleased with myself. I'm not telling you. But I will tell you off air if you just keep it discreet. Did you enjoy the interview? Um, I fucking loved it. Yeah. What I loved about it was it's a bit like your hardest spa or your toughest experience in business. I just felt like I grew as an interviewer like yeah. that overnight. Mm. Because we all want to get on with our guests. Um, but actually, the ones you grow through, like, you could you could put Donald Trump there, and I know I could match him up. Yeah. Put Piers Morgan there, yeah, I know fine. I could match yeah. him up. But before Chris Eubank, maybe not. Mm. But, but I can. So you learn a lot. Yeah. Because you've got to be in there and you've got to feel it. Like, when you're there and you're like, fuck, this is awkward. And you sit there and you smile. Because uh, he didn't, it wasn't just awkward, it was weird. <laughs> it was, and he mate, did, it was weird like, at times, like, wasn't you, it? You didn't know this, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you this. Yeah. When we sat down, I started talking to him and he blanked me. And you know, you normally have a bit of chat mm. before, mm. he just blanked me and would not talk to me. And here's the thing, we couldn't work out <laughs> Like, because at times it was clear because he said some things that he's doing it for the show and the persona of Chris Eubank and to put really good content out there. And then at times it was like, is he doing this because he's not sharp in his mind? Or and it was always, it was really difficult to work out which, mm. it was like in and out of different characters. But imagine sitting here, you, you know, you had to do a bit of messing around to mm. get this thing started. And you start conversing with me and I just sit there like that and I don't even don't even acknowledge you. And I just growl. <laughs> I mean Mate, what was the growling he was doing? I, I remember know. seeing it. Yeah. Were you were you thinking what was, what was going through your mind when he was growling at you? I honestly, within minutes, I just thought, this is gonna be the best podcast yeah. interview yeah. I've ever done. Yeah. Because it was just so different. Yeah. And if you are would I rather have a really nice but tame conversation or a fucking awkward, sticky, <laughs> like, get me the fuck out of here, but I'm staying. I'll take that one. Yeah. All day long. Be yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because one, that's what everyone talks about. Yeah. And you grow 
uh, yeah, I grew as a guest, uh, as an interviewer. Tell me about your world. Like you've jumped on the podcasting in the UK really early. When was your first episode of your seven, podcast, seven and Disruptive and a half Entrepreneur? Years ago. Seven and a half years ago. Is it seven? Is that right? Yeah, it's called Disruptors now. Oh, you've changed it, haven't you? Yeah. Of course you have. Yeah. I mean, why did you... So seven and a half years ago you started. Yeah. You've done how many episodes? Nearly a thousand, is it, Harry? Between both podcasts, over a thousand. Okay, so I have a podcast called Money. So yeah, between them, just the just the just the disruptive on just, just, under, a, just under a thousand episodes. Yeah, so not many people. What have done did more you than that. What did you see before everyone else about the podcasting world? Because I only found podcasting really two and a half years ago in lockdown. That's when we set up our one. I was yeah. like, "Oh, podcasting, let's give it a go." I didn't know anything about podcasts. Half the U- ninety percent of the UK didn't know anything about podcasts when we started. Now, over the last couple of years, everyone's jumping on it. What did you see seven years ago? Um, an opportunity to reach more people, an opportunity to have really interesting conversations, which I love to do. Um, and I was a fan of podcasts. But where did you see that? Do you see it from America? Yeah, I mean, all the podcasts I listened to before I started my own, i.e. nine years ago, they were all American. Yeah. There wasn't, I couldn't remember, don't knew, I would have probably been one of the first Brits, I would have thought. Yeah, I would have thought so. Back then. Yeah, they were nearly all American. Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, you know, those kind yeah, of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what have you seen, how have you seen the podcasting world grow over the seven years? And when have you seen the biggest trajectory? Um... We've never had a, a moment of exponential growth. It's been steady growth, mm. unless we get a wild guest and then we get a spike, yeah. like Andrew Tate and mm. Jordan Peterson and David Icke. And normally, for us, it's the more controversial ones that get the biggest. Um, and so we have the, these moments where, you know, you get ten million downloads and views in forty-eight hours. Mm. And you get 35,000 new followers mm. in a week. Mm. And those, those happen X number of times per year. And all the other times, it's just slow and steady. Weirdly, it, it was probably easier to get guests five years ago than it is now. And I wish I'd have known. Because I thought as we get bigger and better, it will be easier to get guests. And what we found is because there's a lot more podcasts and media is changing, people are being very selective. So people we would have bagged are like, oh, when we do our next round of promotion or when we launch our next book or when we're next in the UK, we get a load of that now, whereas we'd have just got it before. Mm. So the the space has definitely changed in in that regard. Mm. Yeah. How did you... uh get Andrew Tate um, my one of my PAs messaged him well actually one of my PAs got in touch with his agent and they were ding dong back and forth for ages and then we got a message going we're in Dubai come out next week so we just flew out to oh, Dubai you, out, you flew out to Dubai didn't yeah. you, did you yeah why would you want to do that and um, because Andrew Tate at the time was God tier yeah maybe Donald Trump would have been a bigger guest you could count 10 people in terms of the potential for growth alive that might might have been bigger than Andrew Tate at that time I don't even know if I could think of like if I said to Harry would you rather have Andrew Tate or and I listed off all these A listers. He'd be saying Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate, mm. Andrew Tate. At the time, yeah. um, different now because we've done that yeah. and we've had the ups and the downs of that. But at the time, it was like we'd have flown to Timbuktu yeah. to get it done. What have been the ups and what have been the downs of having Andrew Tate on your podcast? Um, so the ups are wild virality. In the first week, it was just blowing up everywhere. And then the downs are then the ongoing um, fallout of that. Like, and, and I'm not talking about opinion because as far as I'm concerned, as a podcast host, these are the opinions of my guests. And if, you, if, if people are going to lambast me 
for the opinion of my guest. They, they need to check themselves mm. and <laughs> have a real think about their judgments. Um, so I don't care about opinion. I care about feedback yeah. and I'll listen to feedback. But, you know, nonsense opinion doesn't do anything for me. But we got our YouTube account shadow banned. We had endless videos taken down from YouTube and TikTok and both like our TikTok at one point was just going wild. It's just like flatline now. Our YouTube's a bit of a graft and a grind. Yeah. It seems like on every channel we raced a quarter of a million followers and then just something fucking happens. Yeah. And and our Andrew Tate era, because we went Andrew Tate, Katie Hopkins, Chris Eubank, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> And honestly, that's three big hits. Yeah, that for... that, that two <laughs> week, that two weeks, we were uh, Harry's little saying is let's let's get bigger than Jesus, mm. and we were bigger than Jesus in those few weeks, and then bang, everything started getting taken away yeah. because they are controversial. Um, so we're now in the middle of rethinking: do we chase those kind of people, or do we play a bit of a longer game? Yeah. Um, but. Whoever it is, I try and drive an interesting conversation. And normally an interesting conversation is more interesting with an interesting person. Absolutely. And not a vanilla person. Yeah. I um, like real people. People say to me, get more celebrities. I want real people with real stories. Yeah. Celebrities are great. Don't get me wrong. The difficulty with that, though, is you don't know what a real conversation is until you've until had it. Until you've had it. Agree. Yeah. What did you like about Andrew Tate? What I did like about Andrew Tate, I still like about Andrew Tate. I like his you are responsible mm. Mm. attitude. I, I like his, um, the way he hacked social media to his advantage. It, it is like if you want a case study. That's genius, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I agree. Like, I agree. And you, you can hate him and you can disagree with him, but you can't deny that. Also, I judge people on my experiences with them. And when we went out to meet Andrew, he was 25 minutes early, bearing in mind Chris Eubank was five hours late. And um, we got three and a half hours out of him with no like... Brilliant. And um, really nice to my team that were out there. And we stayed in touch. And, you know, he, he helped a bit with pushing the podcast out there um and he was good to deal with and th there's plenty of people in the celebrity interview world that are a pain in the ass yeah. to deal with mm. and we've had so many guests that have bailed like five and six and seven times one of them is on your board there i won't mention their name mm. um and you're like for fuck's sake yeah if you say yes do it if you don't want to do it Say just no. let me know all good mm. but the amount of you know fuckery that goes <laughs> on but look i'm also not bitter because this is people yeah and at the end of the day if they saw me as important enough they wouldn't and mm. if they do seem as important they would i'm, I'm fine with it but like oh, i i interviewed jake paul um and obviously he's massive and the first time he just didn't turn up and where he, did you interview him it was on zoom zoom okay i hate zoom i hate zoom but you take it well, for that, I, I for hate that. Zoom, but if Donald Trump's on Zoom or nothing, I'll do yeah, Zoom. Yeah. It's one of those. Yeah. So um, it just didn't turn up for the first one. Well, so who organised it? You organised His assistant. His assistant said, his assistant. Well, we're on 100%, yeah. Yeah. and he just didn't turn up. No, so you're sitting he, there with the computer yeah, open. Yeah, and his oh. assistant didn't even know where he was. That was experience number one. And then the second time, he turned up really late. And then the first, it was like this. <laughs> and the first thing he said was, so how long is this? Oh, mate. And I went, we've got scheduled for an hour. And he went, for what? An hour? Nah. No. <laughs> like, and that was the first. And I'm like, okay, maybe we'll get it done in 40. <laughs> if, if I was interviewing him now and he said that, yeah. I'd be like, you've agreed an hour. Yeah. Or off skis. So let, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. And Did you have to pay Jake Paul? <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards. Did you have to pay Jake Paul? Yes or no? Why are you bothered about that? Because I want to know. If you want to know, why don't you ask me off it and respect the fact that I don't want to say it on it? I'm not asking how much. I'm asking you, did you pay him? Yeah, but you still haven't answered my question. And I'm allowed to be the interviewer as well. Why are you so bothered about asking me if I paid for Jake Paul 
on your podcast. Because I'm interested to see how much it means to you to have him on your podcast. Um, Harry, should I answer this or not? What do you think? Whatever uh, you say, Canning will be used against you. <laughs> um, no, I didn't pay him. So for this whole conversation here, it obviously sounds like you did pay him. I won't ask you how no, much. No, I just said, no, I didn't pay him. Yeah, but I, so won't, what, I, won't, I, won't, so, I won't ask you how so much. So do you think I'm lying then? No. No. I but believe you. No, I didn't. I believe you. I didn't pay I believe him. you. You didn't pay him. I respect that. Yeah. But have I paid people? Yes. Why Who have you paid? <laughs> right. I'm going to take control of this. <laughs> All right. Mate, this is my podcast. <laughs> who, who, who? Yeah. Do you I'm enjoy not... paying people? Let's just, let's just soften this. Do you enjoy I... paying people? You, obviously, you'd rather have them for free. But do you think it's worth paying people just for the knock-on effect of Instagram, YouTube, your podcast on Spotify and Apple. So as your profile, as their profile is a big profile, your profile is ra raising with it. Is that how you see it? Have you ever paid a guest? No. Never? Never. So I think you've got some personal motives for asking this, which is absolutely, absolutely fine. I remember so, I freestyle all my podcasts. There's nothing's pre-planned. It's just you and I having a combo. Yeah. So um, I'm going to give you some context because yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. Um, if I tell you everyone I've paid it might make it hard for me to get future guests yeah. without because people think because they'll just assume yeah. well Rob will put yeah, 10, agreeing. 20, 30 yeah. grand so I reserve the right yeah. to answer the question how I want yeah. I know someone mm. and I won't mention their name because I'm not that kind of mm. guy I know someone who keeps saying he doesn't pay podcast guests and I know for a fact he does yeah. and part of me thinks you're lying little toad mm. and part of me thinks I respect your right to not disclose that mm. because you are well known and everyone will want a nice 20 yeah. off you. Yeah. And then you just painted yourself into a corner for no reason. Mm. So context, 95% of my guests, would that be about right, Harry? We have not paid. We've got them for free. Mm. Five, let's even say 10%. It's no yeah. more. We have paid. Why would I pay? Yeah. To speed it up. Yeah, okay. Or to get someone I otherwise wouldn't get mm. so sometimes i've got a guest and i know we'll get him in a year because we're talking and it's agreed but it's a year and i want it next week <laughs> so i offer to pay yeah and that might be because we've got a low bank you know we've we haven't got a lot of content mm. back so that's reason number one like would i pay donald trump to get him on my show if i couldn't get him on his on my show unless i paid him fuck yes i would and i bet you fucking would too would you no i would i bet you would Mate, so, I so, so there's an affordable I, amount of money to get Donald Trump and there's a signed in NDA you, you would... I promise you, you I would not me. pay would. Donald right, Trump to who, on this show. Okay, all right, then you might not love him. Who who would be your a GOAT guest to get on this show? Who'd be the best person ever to get on this show? Other than Rob Moore. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd know this. Yeah. Who's his GOAT? I would go, I would go a couple. Okay. I'd go a few, in fact. Yeah. Now you've answered, because I've never really thought about it. Yeah. But now you've mentioned it, I'd go Conor McGregor. Yeah. I'd go Joe Rogan. Yeah. And I'd go Paolo Di Canio. Okay, cool. Remember him? Yeah, I do. Yeah, colourful guy. So you, someone messages you, you can get Joe Rogan on next week for X amount of money. He's in the UK. He's only coming once. It's X amount of money. You can afford it. Do you do it or not? How much? An amount you can afford. No, 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 no. How much? Because everyone's got a price. I do a lot of I'll do a lot of gambling with my mate. I'm not a gambler, but I'm yeah. always daring my mates to do stuff. Like yeah. My say in for the last 30 years, everyone's got okay. a price. 20. Right? You can, t 20 bags, you get Conor McGregor. Fuck it. I mean, that's a bargain. Uh, we, I actually reached out to Conor to get him on the show. He wanted um, half a million. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. My uh, God. Conor, Conor would be great. Yeah. Conor is God tier. Yeah. So let's say 20, because 20, you can get either Conor or Joe, yes or no. No. Bullshit. No. Get me from 20, I'll turn them down. <laughs> I don't believe you. Mate, I promise you. I don't believe you. I promise you. Would, I would you try pay... and talk him into... <laughs> I don't believe... I'm, I'm... I promise you, I would not pay 20 bags for Joe Rogan or Conor McGregor. Well, then you're, a f you, no. you're not taking podcasting seriously Why? enough. Because that's, that's just instant blow up. Yeah, great. That's instant but, virality. But, but for what? Well, you meet the person, you get to know them. I'm not, you paying probably... 20, I'm not paying 20 Gs to, have, to meet someone for an hour. Well, you're not rich enough then. 
It's nothing to do with money. <laughs> I don't. It's nothing to do with money. Yeah. Ten. It's nothing to do. Ten. No. No. Well, I promise you, I would not pay that money for the, for, for for someone to come in here and talk to me for an hour. Well, you might get two and a half. I mean, Joe Rogan doesn't do hour conversations, yeah, does he? Even, he does even, three. Even that, it's just, it do, if, it's just not, it just doesn't rock my boat for that. That's well, just me. Well, well, and then you get to swap phone numbers afterwards and stay in touch. Whoopie Joe's do, whoopie do. I know a lot of famous people. It don't, it doesn't, I don't get excited by that. I don't think, oh, I've got Joe Rogan's mobile and this is amazing. I'm all excited. It doesn't. So, okay, so, all right. So why do you do the podcast then? Because I love it. I love chatting to cool people. And I love so you're, to some mad stories. Yeah, so you're. And I do t- the podcast because I found something that I own a festival, as you know, and that's once a year. All chips into that. I found so, something that I absolutely yeah. adore doing. And so your top two guests, you've got a chance to get them. And I wouldn't I'm, pay I'm, them. I'm going to assume that 10 or 20 is not a huge amount of money for no. you. And I'm, you can put it through the business. And you've just turned that down. I think you're an idiot. Yeah. I, I, think, don't, I, I, I don't think so. But we're no, different. No, no, we're no, different. no, no, no. Let we're me different. finish. I think you're an idiot for turning it down. I don't mm. think you're an idiot person. I think mm. you're a, a good person. I think that would be a really dumb move to turn down Connor or Joe Rogan for 20 grand, mm. personally. Yeah. Because the upside is just so potentially big. How many people have you got working on your personal brand? So let's just explain your personal brand. It's your podcast, your Rob Moore websites. What else is there that people are working on? All my social media. How many full timers have you got on you? Pr- prob- roughly. Yeah, probably five or six. Okay. Yeah. And Stephen probably. Bartlett's got thirty working on his diary of a CEO. Yeah, well that's why um he's having the success that he's having with that podcast. Yeah. Because he is putting time, resource, energy and money into it. And it's his pretty much sole focus. Mm. I'm running a 20 plus million a year mm. training business, 360 property, property portfolio. I'm training. Staff. Yeah, I'm yeah. training for a fight. So for me, my podcast is my little part time mm. hobby. Which and, you enjoy. Which I enjoy. Mm. Um, but yeah, he, he, I, that doesn't surprise me one bit. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people would be like, wow, mm. I can't believe that. Mm. But. It's that's obvious to me. Mm. Yeah, because, and, you know, he's now built one of the top British personal brands in the country yeah. because of that. Mm. And um, he's done phenomenally well. Phenomenally well, hasn't he? Yeah. Hats off to him. Yeah, I, I always. Do you like him? Do you like his persona? Well, they're two different questions, aren't they? Yeah, there's two questions for you. Yeah. Um, so um, I interviewed Stephen. And he was like, yeah, this has been great. We've gotten really well. He's like, you've got to come on my show. And then just went off into the oblivion. And I think if you say something, you should mean it. And if you say something, you should do it. But can I judge him for that when, you know, I'm not as A-lister as some of his guests. Mm. And... Have I said something to someone in the past and they're not delivered? Absolutely. What I was saying about human traits. So I can't really get on my high horse and judge him for that because I'm not a perfect human. But I told you my experience with Andrew Tate and what mm. it was. And my experience with with Steve wasn't... He and we were fine and we chatted and it was everything was bigged up and we were going to do... He was I was going to go on his show and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then, you know, Stonewall, ghosting and whatever else. And just dealing with his team um, wasn't the best. But, you know, maybe he had bigger fish to fry. I don't mm. know. Um, and that's my only personal experience with him. In terms of... So that's all I can say. Yeah. Don't know him well enough to judge. Yeah. And... I would only judge when I knew someone well enough. In terms of his persona, um, there's one thing I know is bullshit and I'm not going to say what it is. Everything else, I think, you know, he's built a great brand. Mm. Yeah, he has figured out a way to get people emotional on his show. And I know he knows that that makes it viral. He's got the right guest at the right time because yeah. we've got in the past the right guest at the wrong time yeah. 
That um, can have an effect. Yeah, yeah. the right. I mean, he, for example, Molly May, perfect time. Um, yeah. And you know, like the guy's a good marketer. Yeah, very. Um, and I'm not a. Yeah, so there's those two little blots, little flies in the ointment. But but for me, they're small. I'm certainly not going to criticize him publicly mm. because I like to celebrate successes. And Same. he's been very intentional. He's got a clear strategy. He's come into a space and he's worked out, right, I'm going all in, spending masses of money on equipment. Yeah. You know, you could argue you don't need that those kind of cameras you don't need that kind yeah. of studio he's well got the, he's got the money to do it why not yeah good luck to him yeah um and like if he plays it smart he's going to be able to feast off that for the rest of yeah. his life there was that issue wasn't there in the media with him and the value of his company and what he'd made out and all that but as far as i see anyone who's successful the media is going to come for you at one point yeah, and i don't know the truth behind that yeah. what um, was it he sold out for 200 mil but he took 40 mil I have no idea. Oh, no. I know. Mean, and and apparently, guess, isn't it? Yeah. Unless you, I was going to say, unless you ask him, you don't know. But um, people don't always tell the truth. Yeah. So you, maybe you would never know. Um, but when I saw that, I thought, I don't know the truth. There could be some exaggeration in there. He wouldn't be the first or the last marketer to exaggerate. Yeah. But um, all that's happening is the media are taking their turn on him. Yeah. Like they will everyone. What would you change about the way the government are taxing us businesses and entrepreneurs right now? Flat rate. Because at the moment we're getting taxed on turnover. Surely it's just be just purely should be taxed on your profit. With VAT, business rates, national insurance, everything else as a business owner we've got to pay constantly. And they're saying 70% of businesses do not earn money out there. 70% of businesses don't earn profit at the moment. I'm guessing we're, after this year, it's going to be a lot more, I'd imagine. Yeah, so what, what you've said I would love, but it's not realistic. Okay. I would give, me the, give me the perfect Rob scenario if you ran this country for entrepreneurial business startups. Okay. So as much as I would love for us only to be taxed on profit, you just said most companies mo don't make any profit. Therefore, the country wouldn't generate... Generate, generate any anything. revenue yeah, off entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. But then you could argue, yeah, but if they weren't taxed so much, they could make more profits. So it's yeah. a bit of a vicious cycle, but they're never going to make enough money out of profit unless they helped us make profit. So that's yeah. that's unrealistic. Yeah. Um, I think number one should, should be a flat rate, i.e. 20%, 25%. At the moment, it's VAT, corp tax, income tax, oh, I see. national okay, insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it gets confusing. Uh, if pension you're contributions. Business, yeah. Um, business rates. Yep. There's a load of things that aren't called tax yep. that are a tax. National insurance is a tax. Business rates is a tax. Yep. So they, you, you, can, you can't polish a turd mm. and they're trying to call the turd something else. It's not. It's still a fucking tax. <laughs> and there's more and more of these and they think we're fucking stupid yep. enough to, oh, well, that's not a tax. That's a national insurance yeah. contribution. Yeah. That goes to X. Still yeah. a fucking tax. Yeah. So, so if you added up what they're doing now and put it under a flat rate, what percent would that be? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd love it to be low, wouldn't no, I? But, but well, no, no, not for you. I'd buy it as well. I'd love it to be low. But what is it it sits at the moment? <sighs> Employees, national insurance. Uh, oh. It goes on. 20% plus... 57, plus. 57%? Yeah. About that? Yeah. And that's not what you buy. That's just what you generate in revenue. Yeah. And then everything you buy, there's tax on, on top of that, on top of that. Yeah. There's um, fat on everything you buy, but you're not, yeah. you can't claw that you back. You can't claim that back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on various goods and services and food and things like that. So... I reckon you're paying about 70% tax in everything you earn and everything you buy. Mm. How is that fair? Mm. How is That's that wrong, fair? Isn't it? Yeah, so let's be kind and say it's 50 50. Yeah. Even if it is, you're working 25 hours a week for yourself and 25 hours mm. a week for the government. Mm. And there's fucking potholes and the NHS is fucked. And, yeah. none, you know, they're putting us in lockdown and mm. it's just, it's just all wrong. So, Number one, it would be a flat rate because. Yeah. Give me a number. What percent of that flat rate? Well, it would depends. Be roughly, it depends. If we can, if we can get a little bit out of the super rich, yeah. it might be able to be 25 percent. So, at the moment, people don't understand the difference between rich and super rich. Mm. So, super rich is Google, Amazon, yeah. Facebook, billionaires. Yeah, and they pay four percent corp tax. Mm. You pay 
now 25% corporate tax is what it's going up yeah. to, and it was 19. Yeah. You're rich, they're super rich. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, tax the rich. No, 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 tax the super rich. Because would it be fair if, okay, look, the super rich, they've got good accountants, they should be rewarded for creativity. Yes, they bring in thousands of jobs, but we do as well, mm, all of us yeah. smaller, smaller yeah. ones. But if they just paid 8% corp tax, not four, that would generate trillions yeah. probably. What's, what's an extra 4%? of the turnover of all the biggest companies in yeah. this country is yeah. trillions. Yeah. So what I'd like to see happen is just a little bit of, a little percentage of that trickle down, which would be trillions, which means we can soften the blow mm. on the small entrepreneurs because the small entrepreneurs actually generate a lot of the economy. I think it's 90% yeah. of the economy. So, but realistically, these super rich are funding election campaigns and probably making big donations mm. and therefore driving policy mm. and they have a lot of power yeah. and it would be very easy for me to say oh, well I would never do that but if I had a, a hundred billion company and I could influence policy to the advantage of my company and I mm. could get my corp tax down I'd get my corp tax down to four percent if yeah. I could yeah. um, so I, 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 it's human nature mm. but yeah a, a bit of the super rich flat rate and I'd incentivize and reward entrepreneurs. So let's say you're starting a business. I'm going to give you six or 12 months, no business rates. Yeah. And you're going to get to a certain level, then I'm going to give you business rates. Yeah. And I'm going to have a few like um, loans and grants that you can go and get, which might be funded like you. So I, for example, if the government came to me and said, look, we want to fund a load of startups. You've got the Rob Moore Foundation. Would you donate 10,000 pounds from the Rob Moore Foundation or 100,000 pounds to the government fund? And we're going to put that into entrepreneurs and we're going to get rid of their business rates and we're going to reduce their taxes till they get to some point i'd do that yeah. so entrepreneurs yeah. helping entrepreneurs but the government have got to start that process yeah. and want to help entrepreneurs and they don't mm. that they they know um that we're we're an easy political win for them mm. because most of the population don't like entrepreneurs and rich mm. people so we're not a vote we're mm. not a vote that counts we're t too small a vote so if we if they go against us that's good for their voting um, and they don't understand how to grow an economy. Mm. All they know, all they, if, if you've got one tree that bears fruit and you cut the tree down for the wood, you can do that once. Mm. Um, and the, the, that's what the government are doing mm. with the economy. They're ruining it by increasing taxes here, there and everywhere and increasing debt. Instead of thinking, okay, how can we drive innovation? How can we drive growth? How can, how can we encourage people to come back to work instead of work from home? Mm. But they would never understand because they're not entrepreneurs. They don't run a real economy. A real economy has to have a profit and loss and it has to have a positive balance sheet and it has to be solvent. Your company will be solvent. It will make a profit. It will have a balance sheet which has more asset than liability. The government has more liability than asset. It is trading insolvently and they've made it legal for them to do that illegal for us to do that. Mm. It's all fucking wrong. It's mm. all fucked. Mm. Rob, where do you see your future, mate? Um, so I want to be in business till I'm 100 and whatever. <laughs> and um, I don't want to stop. Mm. I've semi-retired loads of times and I just get really bored and itchy within days. Yeah. Um, I'll continue to buy property with my business partner and we'll build that empire. I'd like the training business to maybe start going into other English speaking countries. Like if I, if progressive property and progressive success, my training companies were in America, it would be yeah, 75 be, million, yeah. 100 million company. Um, but we're in the UK and it's smaller. So maybe we might look to go into these other countries. I'll keep writing books. I'm writing one and I've got my next two planned. How easy is it to write, write a book? Now. Um, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to write a book. It's harder to write a good book. Yeah. But. And you've written how many books? 18. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What's your favorite book of those 18? Probably Money, because it's my favorite subject. And because it's one, I like. Is that your favorite subject? If you were at a wedding somewhere and someone was on the table and there's a load of couples then someone started talking about money, would you be all over that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, challenging their bullshit beliefs that they've bought into from mainstream media yeah. and their family and friends and the system and the banks and the government, you know, the rhetoric. Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of people avoid talking being on, yeah, talking yeah, about money yeah. and being honest about money. 
you know, because you said you like holidays. Well, good you holidays are expensive, yeah, yeah. especially yeah. if you've got kids yeah. and especially now with the cost of living yeah. and inflation. So a really good holiday being, because to have a really good holiday, not only do you want to go somewhere nice and mm. I won't project, but if any everyone listening, imagine your perfect holiday. It's probably not the cheapest, shittiest, mm. Mm. all-inclusive one. It's probably a nice one in a nice place and a blah, blah, blah. Barbados for a month. There you go. Yeah. Here's the biggest cost, mm. taking a month out of your business to be able to afford to do it. People don't think about that. The cost of a holiday might be 20 grand, but for you to take a month off work is your month's salary. Or- That's if you are 50, working for someone. It is. Or if you're an entrepreneur, most entrepreneurs work for themselves. You know, mm. they have one staff member, mm. two staff member. Uh, you know, I could go on holiday for a year, but mm. most people haven't built their business up to do that. So that all takes money. Because I think the thing with money is, People project judgment into it, i.e. they get emotional about it. Mm. But if you think about a hammer, you can take a hammer and it's a good lever to knock a nail in a mm. piece of wood and you wouldn't think anything of it. It's a good lever to pull a nail out of a piece of wood better than your fingernails. Mm. You can also use a hammer to smash someone's skull in. Mm. But let's say someone took a hammer and murdered someone. The hammer isn't on trial. It's just a tool. Mm. What's on trial is the human who used that tool for um, for murder. That's what money is. So money is a fuel. It's a tool. It's an enabler, an exaggerator, an accelerator. Mm. But it's just a tool. And people judge. There'll be people listening to this podcast that will judge me because I've paid guests. I slightly judged your business acumen for not paying guests. So there's all judgment mm. around money. Mm. It's the most emotive subject. Mm. Yet in this country, it's the thing most people have got their the handle on the least. Well, everyone, everything revolves around money. Yeah, of course it does. Every minute of every day, someone's working somewhere, someone's doing it. Everything revolves around money. Yeah. Why do you think there is jealousy around money? Because everyone wants it and no one will fucking admit it. Yeah. Everyone wants a nicer car, but no one will fucking admit it. Mm. And you don't have to want seven cars, but you probably want a nice one. Mm. Um, so it's like, you bastard, you've mm. got what I want, but I'm not brave enough and vulnerable enough mm. to admit that I haven't done what it takes to get what you've got. And I'm not in the student enough humility mindset to go and learn from you instead i'll just criticize you because when i criticize you for being a greedy capitalist bastard it makes me okay for fucking my life up and you won't judge me <laughs> <laughs> and as you can tell i've had some experience in this do you think you've become a better person earning more money mm, mm. money has enabled my good traits yeah so um it's hard to be generous with money when you're broke Every time I get a taxi, every time, I always round it up to the nearest 20. Mm. So if it's four pound, it's 20. If it's 16 pounds, it's 20. If it's 21 pounds, it's 40. I've, by the way, I've never told anyone that. Mm. I do it all the time. Mm. And giving a taxi driver a tip the same as the fee always makes their day. They love it. They, they'll do other things for you, which I won't mention mm. on this podcast. What, in the back, um, in the back of a black cat? No, it's not, <laughs> it's not that. It's to do with money. I was no, <laughs> you dirty bastard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what money has enabled me to do is, is it's exaggerated my good traits. Yeah, okay. And I try and resist it, exaggerating my dark traits. Okay. But it tries. Yeah. It fucking tries, yeah. you know, greed. Yeah. It, it's there. So you're finding that the more money you've got, the more generous you've become. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah. how can you be generous when you're broke? The only thing you can give is time. Now, I know time, time is valuable. Is a valuable thing. But, you, but if you're broke, you haven't got the time to give. Mm. So actually, one of the great... I gave someone a 40-minute consultation session. A year's worth of mentoring with me cost 50 grand. So one of my team... How much? 50 grand. 50, 50 bags. Grand, 50 grand. Do people pay I'm that? I'm worth every penny. Do yeah, people pay people that? People pay that. Why wouldn't they pay that? I'm not saying they weren't, but yeah. 50 bags. Yeah. What, and how, what do they get with you? They get a year's worth of mentoring. And what's me. that? Once a day? Once a week? Once a month? <laughs> once an hour. Pitch the tent outside my house. Um, yeah, so, so I have, what they get I have for group What do they get for 50 grand? So group masterminding at 25 grand, one to one at 50 grand. They get access to me and all my knowledge experience of 17 years building a 150 
plus million in revenue, probably biggest private rental empire in Peterborough, author of 18 so business-related books. You've done. Okay. But remember I said that money buys speed. Yeah. So why would people invest that money? By the way, I have do you think that maximum 50 clients. I'm not interested in Do you think that 50 Gs amounts. speeds them up rather than learning themselves to go, you come to me, pay the 50 Gs, and you're going to be sped up by five years? Well, the reason I can charge 50 Gs and people pay me 50 Gs mm. is because it speeds me up. And if I could speed them up more, they'd pay me 100. And mm. if I could speed them up less, they'd pay me 20. Mm. Because I, I wrote the formula for wealth. Wealth equals fair exchange. Plus, wealth equals value plus fair exchange times leverage. The new version will be wealth equals perceived value plus fair exchange times leverage. So I know the formula for wealth. Um, and I know I give fair exchange for that yep. that 50 grand. And, uh, how many, and how many one-to-ones they get with you in that year? Is it personal one-to-one or is it Zoom? Um, it can be whatever they want. Like if they want to come down to my office and want to spend some time with me, they can. I think we um, we we have a minimum that they can get, which is eight Zooms, eight one-to-ones, and they get my mobile number and they get access to me on WhatsApp mm. 24, 7, 365, which most people won't do, yep. but I quite like yeah. doing it. But then yesterday, um, some one of my staff members came up to me and said, oh, this, this guy's a big fan of yours. It was in the afternoon. He's a bit lost on where he wants to go to really like a chat. So I said, give him, give me his number. My, took my daughter to netball, was watching her. I just phoned him up and I gave him 40 minutes of my time for free and he was blown away. And that's what money yeah. can buy you, the time yeah. to do things like that. Because otherwise, I'd have, if I didn't have any money, I'd have to be at work mm. and I wouldn't be able to do that. And then mm. I'd be at home with my family and I wouldn't be able to do that. Mm. And I can take my daughter to netball because I don't have to be at work. I go yeah. in the office once. On average, I go in the office less than a day a week. Yeah. Happy days. Yeah. That's how it should be. Mm. Yeah, pe- people's businesses own them. Yeah. And, y- you know, you want to try and own your business. But it's not easy. But then... Nothing worth it is, you said, is writing books easy? Mm. It's the wrong question. You should say, is writing books hard? Yeah, then I'll go and do it. Because surely you want to do the hard things. Do you want to pick the easy exercises or the hard exercises? Do you want to pick the easy sparring partners or the hard sparring partners? All depends, this is all why depends if I was good at it. If I wasn't good at writing, I would, want to, I would want to make my life easier. If someone said to me, Dodge, people have said, Dodge, we want to write a book on you. We want to do this. Do you, can you get it going? I wouldn't know where to start. I've got so many great stories about business and life and everything else, it would make a good book. But I don't know where to start. Do you just go in front of a computer and say, right, this is the intro, this is the middle bit? How does it? How does that work? Yeah, there's different ways to write a book. You can write it in your normal life, i.e. try and dedicate an hour a day to it and write it. You can um, bugger off abroad on a really expensive holiday and write it while you're away. And the more expensive the holiday is, the more motivated you are to write the book. Otherwise, it's a waste of an expensive mm. holiday. I've done both of those, mm. by the way. I prefer the latter. Yeah, because it's accountability <laughs> and you yeah. like holidays. Yeah. Um, and then you can, you can voice memo. Mm. So you could just take some time and just talk. Like if someone's struggling to write a book, here's what I recommend. Um, Can't someone write it for you? Yeah, they can. I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. I recommend you go for a walk and just start expressing your thoughts on voice memos. Set up your own little voice memo WhatsApp group between yourself and just go on a walk and just start letting it out because people never start. I wrote a book called Start Now, Get Perfect Later Mm. because most people never start. They stop themselves before they start. Mm. So often just talking it out. Like if you hired a ghostwriter, they're going to sit you down and they're going to get you to talk for hours. Yeah, but it's much easier. Well, I have to say, right, listen to episode one of Eventful Lives, four, seven, 38, 50. It's all in there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So if you've already laid down most of the content, yeah. that's what Stephen's doing, isn't he? He's, launch- he's done a Tim Ferriss model where he's launching a book, extracting all the wisdom from his podcast. From his podcast. Oh, okay. Um, Tim Ferriss was the first person I saw do that yeah. with Tools of Titans. That's a smart yeah. play. That's leverage. Build one really big asset. Yeah. So I built a property asset and then I had property management, property training yeah. off that asset. Yeah. So you're thinking about it a slightly different way. You're, you're looking to leverage an existing asset to write the book. Mm. In some ways that's smart, but the only book I had someone else help me write was probably not my best book because it wasn't my own yeah, voice. Okay. But then I already had a voice. And if you haven't written a book yet, you don't have a voice. Yeah. So my friend, Joel Ratner, lovely guy. He got his book ghost written, and it's a brilliant book. Is he the guy? Is that Ratner Jewelers? Yeah. 
You should have you not had him on? No. You could get him on. Is he a good lad? Ten grand. <laughs> <laughs> and some gold chains. Um <laughs> Gerald is, Gerald is one of my favourite humans. Really? I love Gerald. Is he honest? Oh says it how it is. Oh, like Brilliant. Uh, uh, yeah, he's the you know the people that are so honest. They don't know how to sell or market themselves, and they, yeah. you know they've they're so honest about their vulnerability because yeah. he's not got any other ulterior motive. And he's known for yeah the biggest gaff in history, slagging off his own company. Yes. Well, no, not slag- it, What was no. his words? Yeah, exactly. He he told he told a joke. Um, he had a load of Ratner's jewelers around the country. Yeah, and then he he was, he was the biggest jewelry retailer in Europe. Yeah, breaking America which is rare, and he was at the Institute of Directors doing a speech, and he had a joke essentially equating the value of one of his pieces of jewellery to a prawn sandwich, but i.e. cheap jewellery, yeah. and then that got twisted and manipulated by the mainstream media, and I know other friends of mm. mine who are very famous, so that's mm. happened to them. Mm. So, no, what he is famous for saying, he didn't say. Right. That's why you need to talk yeah, to and find out him to find out. But yeah. you should get him on your show. Oh, wow. He's Love brilliant. Where's Love, he based? Lovely human, London. He's London, is he? Yeah, yeah, he's great, and he's a very honest. Yeah. yeah, Rob, I've really, really enjoyed our chat. Thank you. I've really enjoyed. It. I thank you for making the effort. And I thank you for your honesty. Pleasure. That's that's what you want. Yeah, been really yeah. good. Just before we finish up, how can people find you? Where can people find you? So my name is Rob Moore. Um, so anywhere online you'll find me. Um, if you want to, the Disruptors podcast. If you're into podcasting, yep. this is a podcast. Yep. Um, Amazon, search me on Amazon. I've written loads of business books. Um, Social media platforms, Instagram. It's all Rob Moore Progressive. Okay, you find them all. Yeah, yeah. Quality, mate. Thank you very really much. Really enjoyed it. Cheers. You're a good man. Thank you. Cheers, Rob. All right. <laughs>